capabilities with the, with the active involvement of all relevant stakeholders. Knowledge transfer on different facets of birth defect care and prevention is a crucial element in a country's action plan. This webinar under the theme, Touching the Untouched Areas, is jointly organized by the Expert Committee on Birth Defects of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, the Family Health Bureau of the Ministry of Health, and the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. To give the welcome remarks, I invite Dr. Chitramali De Silva, Director, Family Health Bureau. Over to you, Madam. Yeah, very good morning to all of you. Uh, I warmly welcome all the uh, all the resource persons who are joined with us today at this webinar on birth defect care and prevention. So this webinar is jointly organized by the Ministry of Health, the Family Health Bureau, Sri Lanka Medical Association, and the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. So warmly welcome the president of the SLMA, Dr. Samad Dharmaratna, and also the president of the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, uh, Professor Shaman Rajindrajit, and also all the other resource persons are the Dr. Manjula Danansuri from WHO, and all the hospital directors who are joined with us today, not only the government hospitals, the private hospitals as well, and all the other, uh, maybe consultant community physicians, consultant pediatricians, consultant neonatologists, and consultant obstetricians who are joined from various hospitals or from various districts. So warmly welcome all of you and all the participants who are joined with us at this important webinar. So at this time, I would like to thank or acknowledge the contribution of especially the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians, the chairman, the president, Professor Shaman, and the team for supporting all the activities related to child care, including the neonatal care with the Ministry of Health. And also I thank the SLMA for jointly working with the FHB in this area of work and the WHO for always supporting us for technical and financial uh, support to improve the maternal and child health activities. Uh, so uh, the world uh, birth defects are an important public health issue. It affects the quality of life of the individual and also the affected children and the whole family. So therefore, its prevention is very, very important. I think as public health pers person, I would say we have to pay a lot of attention on prevention of birth defects. If it is possible to take all the attempts to prevent a birth defect. So that's why we collect statistics or the contributory factors for birth defects to take preventive actions. So it is a major cause for spontaneous abortions, infant mortality and infant morbidity, and also the disability and also leading to childhood disability and also to even to the adolescent age and the adult age. So therefore the prevention is the best option, but there are secondary prevention and tertiary prevention measures that we can take by the Ministry of Health. Maybe to earlier diagnosis, screening and early diagnosis is important and also to manage these cases once diagnosed. Do we have adequate services for management of the children with birth defects? So we need to streamline all this uh, with all the uh, facilities available within the Ministry of Health. So I don't take much time. So I must thank once again for all of you for joining with us on this very important day of Birth Defect Prevention Day. Internationally, it is celebrated today and also for all of you for joining with us. So it will be a landmark in the history of birth defect prevention. So thank you once again for all of you and I warmly welcome all the, the clinicians and also the public health people and the administrators who are joined with us today. And I wish this, uh, this webinar a success 
and we will get something out of this today's deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam. I now invite Professor Samad Dharmaratna, President Sri Lanka Medical Association to speak a few words. Thank you very much. I will go without the video. So I would like to thank the organizers of birth defects, care and prevention, touching the untouched, for inviting the president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association to deliver welcome remarks. As you know, and as the director of Family Health Bureau mentioned, birth defects are a global burden and a public health priority, both globally and locally. Sri Lanka Medical Association recognizes the importance of birth defects, the need for its prevention and management, and established an expert committee to address prevention, control, and management of birth defects, the chief organizers of today's webinar. And uh, the Sri Lanka Medical Association, through the expert committee, hosted a very successful international conference on birth defects in developing countries last year and contributed to the efforts in birth defect prevention and care. Today, March 3rd, is the World Birth Defects Day. And the Sri Lanka Medical Association in collaboration with the Family Health Bureau of the Ministry of Health and the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians and other stakeholders are organizing this webinar birth defects, care and prevention, touching the untouched, with the objective of educating the healthcare personnel and the other stakeholders. I uh, should thank the co-chairpersons of the expert committee. All of you know these two personnel, Dr. Kapila Jayaratna. Everyone knows him, a very live wire, very difficult to say no to him. Uh, brings a lot of funds to the country as well as to the SLMA. So uh, he has made the SLMA very rich through birth defects. And uh, thank you very much Kapila and thank you again for keeping this uh, live. And I know you are a live buyer, but keeping this live, keeping the expert committee live, keeping the SLMA uh, in the forefront of this very important public health problem. And then Professor Vadya, Isanayaka, another huge personality, the current Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Senior Chair Professor in Medical Genetics in the Faculty of Medicine, and as also the Sri Lanka Medical Council Chairperson. Another huge personnel who can bring a lot of funds, a past president of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. I should thank both of these because this actually was their idea. I think uh, Professor Disanayak started this long, long time back, I think, uh, be, even before people started thinking and then Kapila got together and so they started the expert committee and uh, continued with this. And basically this is for the today's webinar. Uh, and I should again thank both of you. Thank you very much Kapila and Vajira. And then all the stakeholders also, because without you, we can't have any conference webinar or any Zoom meeting. And then definitely all the participants who are very, uh, thank you for joining us because without you, we can't have a webinar. Uh, so thank you all of you. And then I especially should thank Dr. Chitramali Dizilla, the director of the Family Health Bureau and uh, Professor Shaman Ranjindadi, Again, you know, a huge personality. Not going to talk about him because uh, I mean, I'm not going to thank him or anything. But again, Shaman, thank you very much for collaborating with the Sri Lanka Medical Association in hosting this webinar. And I know with you and uh, Dr. Chitramali and our expert committee, they have planned a lot of things for the future. So they are not going to stop or conclude with the webinar. This is only a kind of a sidetrack thing to educate the people. So again, thank you also for basically collaborating with the SLMA and helping the SLMA. And then uh, thank you for all of you and hope for a very, very successful, educative, useful webinar today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now I invite Professor Shaman Rajindrajit, President College of uh, Sri Lankan College of Pediatricians to speak a few words, sir. 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to address this August gathering <coughs> as the president of uh, uh, Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians. As uh, many uh, the previous two speakers echoed, I would like to thank the organizing committee uh, uh, for a significant uh, mortality and morbidity in this country. Um, it's very important that uh, we realize that uh, the birth defects are one of the major killers uh, in infants. So with that, it is very important to identify them early, <coughs> number one. Number two, how to look, you know, try to prevent it as much as possible through various ways of counseling and, you know, identifying early and other measures. So for, to talk about more, more, more about that, we, the, the committee has lined up really, really uh, uh, key personnel to address this gathering, uh, namely Kapila, Manjula, and Vajira, Nilika, Duminda, Saraji, uh, all of them are expert on their fields. So they will educate all of you uh, with regards to birth defects and how to move forward in the 21st century to eliminate as much as possible, minimize these killers in, in, in our country. So I would like to conclude by saying thank you very much for collaborating with us. Thank you very much for joining this webinar. And uh, for last, not but not least, I would like to thank Dineshani Hetiarachi, who is you know organizing, running behind, and uh, you know calling, sending emails. Dineshani, I think we can be very happy that your effort has materialized. So thank you very much, everybody, and I wish you a very pleasant uh, uh, and educative webinar. We are not going to stop here. I think we will be collaborating with everybody uh, in this committee to run this, for take this forward and try to minimize uh, infant neonatal deaths in this country. All the best and thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Now I invite Dr. Kapila Jayaratna, the co-chairperson of the Expert Committee on Birth Defects and the National Program Manager for Child Morbidity and Mortality of the Ministry of Health to give an overview on birth defects. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, so I will be uh, talking on the birth defects, uh, a key area of uh, uh, birth defects, uh, because there are about 392,000 babies uh, worldwide uh, are born every day. And out of this, 8 million babies are born with a serious birth defect every year. So what is a birth defect? It's the structural or functional abnormalities, including metabolic disorders that occur during intrauterine life, which are present from birth and can be identified prenatally at birth or detected later in life. This is the WHO definition on birth defects. So, as mentioned earlier, birth defects affect babies, families, healthcare systems, and societies. That is why it has assumed a major public health priority area. In the year 2006, for the first time, March of Dimes collated evidence on birth defects from all the world. So then they pointed out the systematic underestimation of the toll of birth defects. In 2010, World Health Organization, in their 63rd World Health Assembly, made a resolution. It's a historical resolution that we should raise awareness, set priorities, and commit resources, also develop plans to prevent birth defects and improve care for the people with 
birth defects. So birth defects is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. When you look at the global burden of disease uh, published by the uh, University of Washington, India for the year 2019, birth defects has caused 549,000 deaths. It's the fourth rank level three cause of under five delis. The combined global incident comes to 62.9 cases per thousand live births. In the year 2019, 50.9 million lived with a birth defect. When you look at the delis of birth defects, neural tubes comes number one, then comes the congenital heart disease, Down syndrome, other chromosomal abnormalities, and down the line, there are uh, many causes. So when you say uh, Delhi, for the people who do not understand Delhi, the one Delhi represents the loss of the equivalent one year of full health. So Delhi is for us, disease or health conditions are the sum of the years of life lost due to premature mortality and the years lived with the disability due to prevalent cases of the disease or health condition in a population. So you will understand the burden caused by birth defects, not only on the mortality, but on the living people. So where are the birth defects people are more located? You will see the dark red areas. Many of these areas are in the developing world or low and middle income countries. You see the Americas, Europe and Australia. So they have done a lot in prevention or caring birth defects. In Sri Lanka, the birth defects prevalence at birth is, comes to about 1.7 per thousand live births. That means every year there are about 5,800 babies born with a birth defect. Out of these 5,800 babies with a birth defect, 30% have a serious birth defect. Even if they survive, they cannot have an independent life. What are the types of birth defects we see in Sri Lanka? We did a survey in the year 2014 in uh, three provinces and studied uh, the adverse uh, prevalence of birth defects. The outcome is like this. The majority, the leading cause of birth defects is the heart disease. Then comes the limb deformities, 20.3% cleft leaf, cleft palate, then genetic disorders like Down syndrome and other uh, uh, syndromes, then uh, central nervous system defects, including neural tube defects. So this is the, uh, these are the uh, leading causes of birth defects we see in Sri Lanka. Not only that, every year nearly uh, 1 million uh, hospital admissions uh, for uh, there are pediatric hospital admissions. Out of that, nearly 9,440 children admit to hospital uh, because of birth defects. So, estimated expenditure to care for uh, these children, the minimum, it comes to about 38 million. Professor Sharman talked about uh, infant deaths. These days we are analyzing the uh, pro uh, profile of uh, infant mortality in Sri Lanka. So the when you look at the 2017 uh, infant deaths, out of the 2,862, 
infant deaths, 26% can be attributed to birth defects. The essence is that many birth defects are preventable. And those living with birth defects can have optimal well-being. We can do many things. So we have to start from somewhere. So we have done a lot over the years, but in a fragmented way. So there is a need to collaborate or get involved everybody, all the stakeholders in prevention and caring for persons with birth defect. As Dr. Chitramali mentioned, so we need to work together on starting from the this day of World Birth Defects Day. So actions are needed. Everybody has a role to play, starting from the ground level field healthcare worker up to the highest level specialist, pediatrician or neonatologist or uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, maybe um, uh, pediatric surgeon. So we all have to get together and work together to achieve in preventing birth defects in this country. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that, that very insightful presentation. Uh, I now invite Dr. Chitramali De Silva, Dr. Manjula Dhanansuria, NPO World Health Organization, and Professor Shaman Rajindrajit to launch the poster for the National Birth Defects Registry. Focus uh, so we request all the hospitals to hospital directors or the hospital staff to uh, post this uh, poster in the in all the units especially in the maternal and perinatal care units and also in the maybe the at the directorate office and also in the statistical sections so that everyone will identify their role in the surveillance system so that we will get quality data on birth defects in the years to come. So that is our wish. We know there's a very good surveillance system, but there are gaps. So we need to strengthen the surveillance system for us to get accurate quality data on time. So I request all the hospital directors to pay attention on this and also to the public health staff again to support this activity and the clinicians, most important group, the pediatricians, the neonatologists, uh, and also maybe the physicians if involved, to get the team to enter the data for us to get accurate data on birth defects. So we hope the surveillance system will be a success. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, and thank you, madam. Now, I invite Dr. Manjula Dhanansuria, NPO World Health Organization, to speak about global best practices on birth defect care and prevention. Over to you, Dr. Manjula. Thank you, Dinesh. I hope I can share my slide. Yes, you can. Okay. Good morning. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, the birth Expert Committee on Birth Defects and the Family Health Bureau and Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians for organizing this webinar on to commemorate 
Global uh, Birth Defects Day and also inviting WHO to be part of this. So uh, before uh, diving into deep subject matter, I think it's good to uh, uh, have the basics and the fundamentals. So I will uh, basically uh, focus uh, att your attention on global evidence-based interventions on birth defects prevention. Uh, uh, again, reiterating what my previous speakers were highlighting, birth defect as a, it's becoming a leading cause of uh, neonatal deaths as well as uh, uh, under five deaths. And uh, again, highlighting what Professor Sharman has uh, uh, it, uh, stressed that uh, as a cause of death, birth defects are becoming more and more important with the declining neonatal and under five uh, death rates globally, as well as in Sri Lanka. So, sorry about this. Uh, as causes, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, focus on genetic, environmental, and complex genetic and unknown causes as causes for the birth defects. And I want to highlight that uh, we need to focus on mitigating the risk factors as well as promoting protective factors in prevention of birth defects. So, sorry about this. I hope you can see my slides. Yes, Dr. Manjana, I can see. I'll go in this mode because, um, with regard to the prevention, research shows majority, that is 70 to 85% birth defects are preventable. So it's a violation of human rights if we further delay action as responsible officers. So as uh, Director Maternal and Child Health highlighted, prevention can be three, uh, 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 three types. Primary prevention focuses about uh, uh, preventive activities where before the, the birth defect occurs, like rubella vaccination and preconceptional supplementation with folic acid. Secondary interventions, secondary preventive interventions can be where the defect is occurred. However, it is detected early and intervened early, like neonatal orthopedic screening for early detection and treatment of congenital dislocation of the hip. Tertiary prevention will focus on uh, reducing the disability and improving the quality of life. So uh, when it comes to the uh, delivery of evidence-based intervention, it is said uh, it is always good to package these interventions and deliver to enhance the cost efficiencies. Excuse so, me, Mandela, can you little reduce the uh, screen some more? Right. Oh, that's good. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. So there are nine evidence-based interventions that can be packaged and delivered during antenatal period. So this include screening for infections, screening for chromosomal abnormalities, treating syphilis-like infections, avoiding teratogens, that is alcohol, smoking, and medication, and also screening and managing chronic conditions like diabetes, hypothyroidism, and especially the obesity. Uh, this is very important in our in countries like ours, we are seeing increasing trend of maternal obesity among our mothers. And also uh, making mothers aware to avoid travel to regions experiencing outbreaks like Zika infection. And also if the mothers are having chronic conditions like diabetes, optimizing the disease before and during pregnancy is identified as an evidence-based intervention managing obesity prior to and during pregnancy. This is very important with regard to the pre-pregnancy BMI as well as uh, adequate or uh, uh, recommended weight gain during pregnancy and also reducing exposure to the environmental hazards. Other interventions like family planning, especially when it comes to elderly women to prevent pregnancy, family planning has been identified as evidence-based intervention. So apart from that, preconception screening and counseling, especially to identify uh, recessive disorders and other risk conditions and optimizing women's diet uh, and optimizing maternal health and other conditions like diabetes, epilepsy, and also warfarin treatment. 
So there are four, ele uh, five elements have been identified uh, that can be packaged and delivered in the newborn period. That is newborn examination, newborn screening for certain diseases like congenital hypothyroidism, and also appropriate and timely medical treatment, early surgical interventions like uh, club food, and also rehabilitation and palliative care services. I would like to highlight the importance of addressing maternal risk factors in prevention of birth defects. It can be give protection, it can be managing conditions, and it can be avoiding teratogens. I would not go into details. However, I would like to focus your attention on few points. For example, folic acid supplementation, WHO recommends weekly iron folate supplementation or daily folate supplementation uh, for pre-pregnancy period and also during first trimester of pregnancy. With regard to rubella vaccination, WHO recommends providing MMR vaccine to all women of childbearing age. With regard to alcohol, we have to communicate that there is no known safe amount of alcohol, no safe time to drink, and no safe kind of alcohol to drink during pregnancy. Smoking, uh, repeated systematic reviews clearly highlight the importance of avoiding first-hand as well as passive smoke exposure to passive smoking because of the clear teratogenic effect of tobacco. And detection of birth defects can be, uh, we can uh, have screening at various points of time, including preconception, antenatal, and newborn screening along the continuum of care so that uh, we can minimize the risk of missing birth defects. Uh, the few slides I would like to share the, about the WHO Southeast Asian region country progress uh, about birth defect surveillance and prevention. Annually, the WHO regional office conduct meetings to um, see the progress towards uh, re reducing birth defects and prevention of birth defects in the region. So what we have seen is that member states are doing uh, very good and significant progress has been made in birth defect surveillance. And we have a regional birth defects database. Uh, our member states are contributing uh, to this database. However, prevention and care of birth defects, we need to do more. The issues and challenges highlighted by member states are birth defect interventions are distributed in different programs, so the coordination is a bit difficult, and also challenges in continuing capacity building on screening and management, and also lack of resources, uh, especially in high-end technologies and multidisciplinary care services to enhance the care and management services for birth defects. With regard to elimination of congenital rubella syndrome, 70% um, of the world infants are, has been vaccinated against rubella in the year 2020, and the rubella cases have been declined by 48% since 2012. And in the world, 93 countries have already been verified as eliminated rubella transmission, including entire Americas. Uh, with regard to Southeast Asia region, uh, we had a goal of measles elimination and rubella control by 2020. However, in 2019 regional conference, this target was revised to eliminate measles and rubella by 2023. And we are happy to see two countries, that is Maldives and Sri Lanka, have already reached the target in year 2020. So that is about the progress. And there are evidence-based strategies and tools available so that uh, you can refer and adapt as a public health program manager or a clinician so that you can contribute to uh, prevention and uh, prevention of birth defects. So why do we need to make birth defects an urgent health priority as highlighted by the SLMA president as well as the college, uh, president of the Sri Lanka College of Pediatricians? As you can see, 70% of birth defects can be prevented or treated but our efforts are very highly inadequate. 8 million birth defects occur annually, affecting 6% of all live births with very high direct and indirect costs, with very high perinatal and postnatal mortality. So if we want to reach the sustainable development goals by 2030, we need to focus on birth defects prevention and care uh, component. 
and inadequate social support and care to those affected. And more importantly, this has become a health equity and a human right issue. So I kindly request all the clinicians and all the public health personnel to focus on these elements and as an individual, what we can do to prevent birth defects in our, in among our uh, babies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Manjula, for that very valuable information and the presentation. I now invite Professor Vajra Disanayaka, the co-chairperson of the Expert Committee on Birth Defects and the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo, to speak on diagnosing and the undiagnosed, genetic testing and counseling. Over to you, sir. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much chair for those kind words of introduction. I selected the topic, diagnosing the undiagnosed for this presentation today, because genetic testing and counseling is making that difference in terms of diagnosing the undiagnosed. As you know, birth defects and genetic disorders remain for most part undiagnosed in terms of what the exact diagnosis is. And as a result of that, families of children with undiagnosed genetic disorders often face an uncertain and unpredictable journey, the so-called diagnostic odyssey. Today, new advances in genetic testing has made it possible to reduce the time and the cost of that diagnostic odyssey, resulting in more accurate diagnoses, leading to better treatment, better prognostication, and prevention of the recurrence of that condition in the family as well as uh, in future generations. When we talk of genetic disorders, everyone's mind goes down to Down syndrome. And even in the case of Down syndrome, it's important to highlight the fact that the genetic mechanism which contributes to the condition, the knowledge of that by cytogenetic testing makes a whole heap of, heap of difference to the way we manage these individual children as well as their families. So it's important to keep that in mind. But for most part, the subtle dysmorphic features tend to be undiagnosed with conventional chromosome culture and karyotyping with only about 5% of cases being uh, diagnosed. But with the advent of microarray technology and uh, even low cost technologies such as MLPA, it has become possible to diagnose at molecular level some of the recurrent microdeletion and duplication syndromes more often than before. As a result of that, more of these children with subtle dysmorphic features now have a diagnosis. And we are able to give them a diagnosis. Going further, there are cases like this, the one described here, with developmental de delays associated, for example, with ambiguous genitalia, which in the past would have uh, ended up with the chromosome culture and karyotype, which does not result in the detection of an abnormality. Today, we are able to do what we call exome sequencing, get down to uh, 
molecular level defect, a pathogenic variant, confirm it with further testing, and also give the diagnosis as to whether it is a new novel mutation, novel pathogenic variant, or one which have been inherited from a parent, enabling us to go further uh, in terms of recurrence risks, recurrence in the family, and so on. We can um, still deal with even uh, subtle abnormalities, most part not showing a lot of dysmorphic features, but a suspicion of a genetic condition as described on this slide. And rather than going through that entire odyssey of genetic, uh, non-genetic tests that this kind of child would undergo with one test, the exome test, get to the bottom of the underlying genetic condition without the need for the time and the expense that we would otherwise have to have spent. So today, with the availability of chromosome culture karyotyping, then microarray with MLPA as a low cost option and exome sequencing, we are getting to a diagnosis more often than before, almost in about 50% of cases. And when we do these tests in our country, we keep on um, discovering new variants which have never been described in our other populations, uh, contributing to the scientific literature in the process as well. So my plea to uh, clinicians who are there is unlike in the past, we should now be using these technologies to make a diagnosis. The Ministry of Health had made it possible by authorizing the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, authorizing the hospital directors to pay for these tests. Uh, as um, um, yeah, as a local purchase so that the patients can get the benefit of them and we provide these services at cost through the human genetics unit in the Faculty of Medicine, Colombo. And we've got the technology and the techniques at our hand to provide this service to anyone who needs them. By way of uh, advertisement, I'd like to invite you to, in two days time, participate in the Rare Diseases Forum organized by the College of Pediatricians, where four of our up and coming new clinical geneticists who are in the training process to become specialists will be making presentations to you on how these kind of technologies have really made a difference in terms of reducing the diagnostic odyssey and bringing benefits to patients. So please attend the Clare Diseases Forum to learn more about how you can use these technologies. We in the Human Genetics Unit would be happy to help you anytime and please do reach out to us if you need our assistance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for that excellent presentation. I now invite Professor Neelika Malavage, Professor and Head of Department of Immunology and Molecular Medicine at the Sri Javadanapur University to speak on COVID-19 and possible birth defects. Over to you, Professor Neelika. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to talk about uh, a topic that actually nobody knows much about COVID-19 and birth defects. So first of all, um, uh, I will uh, let's find out whether actually COVID-19 causes birth, birth defects to start with. 
so what I'll be talking about uh, fetal and maternal complications of COVID-19, speci specifically how maternal complications lead to uh, fetal complications and the question of birth defects. Uh, I think everybody knows how uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection uh, sort of evolved along the time, starting from the Wuhan variant, then different countries having alpha, beta, gamma, then it was delta, and of course, Omicron. So these, these are the number of cases uh, with each of these variants. And of course, because of the high transmissibility of Omicron, uh, the number of cases with Omicron is so much more than all other variants. However, fortunately, the deaths have been very much lower. This is the uh, proportion of deaths per 100,000 uh, for Omicron compared to other waves. However, we know that mortality rates are higher in pregnant women. And also apart from mortality and apart from the complications that occurred in the mother uh, because of the altered physiological status, there was uh, complications that were directly relevant to uh, the fetus. For instance, it has been shown uh, that symptomatic maternal COVID-19 is associated with an increased likelihood of uh, preterm birth. Uh, pre birth. Uh, it's about two to three times greater. Uh, and of course, also that a small for gestational age babies were more likely to be born to mothers who had COVID. And also importantly, uh, the risk of stillbirth was higher along with uh, miscarriages. So although stillbirths were rare, uh, these are uh, data from developed countries, the infection of the mother with SARS-CoV-2 doubled the risk of uh, stillbirths. Now, why has this happened? Now, this is, looks very, very complicated, so I'll talk you through with this. Uh, so don't be scared of all these diagrams. But basically, there have been several studies. So one study, this is one study just showing that the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, so uh, the spike protein is one of the main proteins of the virus, that it has been detected in the cytotrophoblast and the syncytiotrophoblast cells of the placental villi. So in the placenta, this is in the fetal side of the placenta, uh, and which means that the virus has crossed towards the fetal side, side and is causing placental infection. And this study uh, in uh, is ultrasound scan showing of hydroxyphetia fetalis because uh, fetal death. And in this pregnancy, in this case, this is a different study, uh, they have done PCR on amniotic fluid uh, on the placenta and fetal tissues. And what they have found, of course, the mother had uh, asymptomatic COVID-19, that's a different story, but uh, the placental tissues uh, were positive uh, for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 PCR genetic uh, material, the placenta was positive and so uh, was the amniotic fluid. So in other words, the virus was detected in amniotic fluid as well in moderate viral loads. So these were the first studies that were published showing that actually the virus did cross the placenta and infected the fetal side of the placenta and was also found in amniotic fluid. Now, then there have been other studies emerging that the virus can cause vertical, is vertically transmitted. So this is another study, again, showing the syncytotrophoblast cells. And in the syncytotrophoblast cells, this immunohistochemistry staining shows that the virus particles can be seen in the syncytotrophoblast cells. And in a different study coming from Brazil during the first wave, uh, they do show that uh, women with mild uh, symptomatic COVID-19 uh, well, uh, and when you actually got their placentas and tried to uh, detect the virus, they have detected, uh, of the five placentas, they have detected two viruses and were able to sequence them. So this is evidence showing that the uh, virus crosses. And of course, what I haven't showed you is uh, when the virus replicates, uh, it, it shows different proteins. So rather than just the virus being, there, uh, being present, so... Uh, these studies have shown that there have been active virus replication in the fetal side of the placenta. Now, coming to uh, this study, uh, again, uh, a neonatal death. So this mother uh, had, to, uh, had a preterm delivery around 25 weeks gestation, and the baby died, uh, the neonate died four days later. And when you did an autopsy on the baby, uh, RNA was detected in the heart, liver, 
and uh, neonatal and placental tissues, showing that there was extensive neonatal infection with the virus. Like, however, this study, of course, doesn't prove that the infection happened uh, transplacental uh, in utero because uh, the baby died four days later. So maybe possibly there was very rapid disseminated viral infection because it's a preterm baby resulting in that. But however, uh, vertical transmission leading to miscarriages and births seem to be rare, but has been reported. So to summarize that part, uh, because of the maternal complications because, uh, due to COVID, there are problems due to preterm delivery. There is a higher incidence of stillbirth and miscarriages, uh, which could be due to placental insufficiency, uh, insufficiency due to severe metal COVID, hypoxia, and so on. Uh, fever, uh, that it could be because of placental infection. Uh, and of course, the question of vertical transmission, how much vertical transmission actually is responsible for these stillbirths and miscarriages. Uh, so far, there has not been any evidence of congenital anomalies happening in uh, babies who were born to mothers who had COVID uh, in, in, uh, during the pregnancy. Of course, uh, COVID in pregnancy does uh, seem to affect the fetal adversely uh, because of all the issues I highlighted. So uh, what do vaccines do? Now, everybody knows that uh, the reason, main reason we are vaccinating pregnant women is because pregnancy is a high-risk state and even in Sri Lanka, so many pregnant women did die uh, because of COVID and the, so many ended up in ICU and had severe COVID. So the vaccinations in pregnancy are mainly to protect the mother, but how much do they protect the baby? Now, this is uh, one study showing the effect of uh, maternal mRNA vaccines, which is Moderna or Pfizer uh, on the baby. So after the mother had uh, were given either of these vaccines, high levels of IgG, IgA and IgM was detected in the breast milk of the mother. And also high levels of IgG was detected in the cord blood of the babies, okay? And of course, when you compared to vaccine-induced responses in breast milk and in cord blood and compared them to the uh, responses of naturally infected mothers, vaccinated mothers had higher antibody responses in breast milk and also in cord blood than naturally infected mothers. However, the question is how long does this persist and how does that translate into protecting the baby? So this is uh, another study showing uh, the antibody levels, uh, maternal antibody levels vaccinated uh, compared to infected. The vaccinated mothers had higher antibody levels. Uh, there were the vaccinated mothers had higher antibody levels in cord blood compared to infected mothers. And also six months later, most importantly, six months after the delivery, when you looked at infant, uh, six months after delivery in the infant, the infants of vaccinated mothers had higher, significant high antibodies than the infants of infected mothers. And of course, but how does this, this translate into vaccine efficacy? So maternal vaccination in pregnancy significantly reduced the incidence of COVID-19 and hospitalizations in babies uh, born to vaccinated mothers. And this benefit was so much more if the vaccines were given uh, between 21 weeks to 14 days before delivery. As you can see, 5.7 versus 21.6. And when you look at the efficacy rate, uh, when uh, mothers were given uh, COVID vaccines 21 weeks to 14 days before delivery, uh, the incidence of hospitalization in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the mothers who who were, who were vaccinated was 5.7. These are babies who were hospitalized was 5.7 uh, compared to 21.6 in the control infants, even a vaccine efficacy of 80%. So maternal vac vac uh, vaccination prevents hospitalization of infants up to six months and the vaccine effectiveness was 80% and that is significant. Uh, and of course, we know that these vaccines are safe. There have been numerous studies and such large proportion of pregnant women uh, given uh, COVID vaccines by now. And to end, uh, we don't know the, uh, whether con 
congenital birth defects occur because of COVID. So far, there are no studies or no evidence whatsoever showing that the virus causes any uh, congenital defects. However, we know that uh, there can be vertical transmission. Some studies have shown that there is definitely a placental infection because studies have conclusively shown that and vaccination actually prevents all these things. So vaccines appear to protect the baby as well uh, from all these problems and uh, up to six months effectively preventing against hospitalization. So thank you. That's all I uh, have to say. Thank you for giving this opportunity. Thank you very much, Madam, for that very timely presentation. I now invite Dr. Devinda Samarasingha, consultant pediatric cardiologist at the Regulatory Hospital to speak on caring for a child with congenital heart disease. Over to you, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you, Kapila and Dinesh Hani, for inviting me. I think I can, you can hear me. Can you? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the topic is uh, caring for a child with a congenital heart disease. I think this is a, a very important area because most of the congenital defects are heart defects. So what is a congenital heart defect? Congenital heart defect is a heart disease that is there from birth. We get very few acquired heart defects, but uh, most of our practice is on congenital heart disease. About 95 to 98% is on congenital heart diseases. So what is the incidence of congenital heart diseases? Usually we get for every thousand live births, we get about six to eight children with babies with heart diseases. So if you take total live births in Sri Lanka, it's 330,000 per year. We expect about 2,000 to 2,500 children to be born with congenital heart diseases. So if you see 100 children in your practice, either private practice, government practice, in a school medical inspection or wherever, if you see 100 children, there should be at least one child with a congenital heart disease. So if you, were, if you are to detect that child with a congenital heart disease, at least you have to refer three to five children to us to detect that because detection rate among referrals is about 20 to 40%, 40% for cyanotic heart diseases, but 10 to 20% for referrals with murmurs. So you need a high degree of suspicion if you are to detect congenital heart disease. So this lecture will be based on caring for a child with congenital heart diseases. You need to suspect, you need to diagnose, you need to intervene and you need to follow up. So how do you suspect a congenital heart diseases? Before coming into suspicion, you should know what basically congenital heart diseases consist of. Basically, they are categorized into acyanotic and cyanotic. Acyanotic lesions are shunt lesions like ASDs, VSDs, and PDAs. And obstructions are like pulmonary stenosis or aortic stenosis. Cyanotic lesions are basically categorized into tetralogy of fellow, TG, and admixture physiology. Admixture physiology is basically tricuspid atresia where there is complete mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Don't think that is, this is hardcore pediatric cardiology. No, this will be a very simple lecture. So when should you suspect a shunt lesion like an ASD, VSD, or a PDA, where there is high pulmonary blood flow? If you see a child who is tachypneic, tachycardic, or if the child gets recurrent lower respiratory tract infections, if there is difficulty in feeding because he's breathless, if there is tender hepatomegaly, head sweating, if you take a chest x-ray, if you see cardiomegaly with plethoric lung fields, or if the child has failure to thrive, then that should be the first suspicion. Then you would auscultate and find your clinical findings and then you would refer. In shunt lesions, don't expect cyanosis. They will become cyanosed when they become inoperable. So you know how to suspect a shunt lesion. Obstructions, there will be a murmur. They will be basically asymptomatic. That is the catch. Most of these obstructive lesions will be asymptomatic. And if you take an ECG, you will have ventricular hyper features of ventricular hypertrophy. So auscultate carefully to detect a murmur if you want to suspect an obstructive lesion. Cyanotic lesions, obviously, they will be cyanosed. If the saturation is less than 87%, you will see with your naked eye. Otherwise, if it is above 87%, you will need a pulse oximetry. Pulse, oximetry, pulse oximeters are now available. 
but you need to use a good quality pulse oximeter to detect desaturation because some of the pulse oximeters, if you insert a pencil, even it will give some reading. So they will have a murmur. And if you take a heart, if it is a chest x-ray, if you take a chest x-ray, if it is a boot-shaped heart, suspect tetralogy of fellow. If it is an egg on a side appearance or egg on a string appearance, suspect transposition of great arteries. If it is a, if you see snowman sign, suspect total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. So now you know how to suspect asynotic and cyanotic congenital heart diseases. So how do we diagnose these heart diseases? Basically, it is through echocardiogram. You can do chest X-ray and ECG to support your suspicion. Sometimes, rarely we subject them to cardiac catheterization, CT, MRI to get some specific information. But 99% of the time, echocardiography alone is enough in today's context to diagnose a congenital heart disease and send them for intervention. How do we intervene? There are two types of intervention. The first type is in the catheterization laboratory where the cardiologists perform the intervention. We do about 1,000 intervention, cardiac catheterizations per year out of that about 700 uh, interventional procedures. Then the rest goes to the surgeon and uh, cardiac surgery, we have, we are doing about 800 to 900 surgeries every year. So who needs these interventions? Do all patients need interventions? No. Congenital heart disease is a spectrum. On one end, you get the most complex ones. On the other end, you get the most simple lesions. So what are they? If you take high plastic left heart syndrome is considered as a most complex. There are so many other examples. PFO or a tiny PD or a muscular VSD is taken as a most simple lesion. In between, you get a spectrum. So in current Sri Lankan context, for most complex ones, where you need multiple surgeries, but still with a guarded prognosis, we go for conservative management because we have limited resources. We have to act on the available resources. The most simple ones, they don't need any intervention, so we don't do anything for them. Others, the complex ones will need multiple surgeries like univentricular hearts. Sometimes it's a single surgery for TGA, tetralogy of fellow and a VSD. Sometimes it may be a surgery plus a catheter intervention like pulmonary atresia, interventricular, intact ventricular septum. Tetralogy of fellows also, sometimes it may be an intervention followed by surgery. Or it may be a catheter intervention alone, like for aortic stenosis, pulmonary stenosis, ASD closure, PDA closure. There are so many other examples. So this is the simple approach we take when it comes to interventions. Remember, it's a spectrum. And there are various, it's all individual treatment. You can't give blanket treatment for ASDs, do this. No, there's nothing like that. It is based on individual patients, anatomy, physiology, and the needs. So we know what to, how to intervene. Follow-up is very easy, but most of them will need follow-up. Don't think that once the ASD is closed, that patient doesn't need follow-up. No, at least for few years, we need to follow up. Most of the patients, you need lifelong follow-up, like tetralogy of fellow TGA corrections. They need lifelong follow-up. But it is only evaluation to look for complications, and they don't need to be on long-term drugs. So basically, minimal cost to the family or no cost to the family. It is only evaluation, basically done to identification of complications, early identification. So what is the cost? Cardiac surgery in current context in government sector even costs about 400,000 to 2 million, depending on the ICU state, maybe even 10 million if the patient stays for months in the ICU, which happens very rarely. Catheter interventions, they don't go to ICU. The cost is basically the consumable cost and the staff cost which comes to about 100,000 to 300,000, even in the government sector. So is it cost-effective for Sri Lanka, intervening for cardiac diseases? Is it cost-effective? How do you determine the cost-effectiveness of an intervention in medical practice? This applies to anything, any, any practice. If for USA, it will be about 50,000 US dollars for one year of quality-adjusted quality life, one quality, 50,000 US dollar intervention is cost effective because 
it, the per capita GDP in US is was when this book was written, it was about 47,200. Now it is about 65,000 US dollars. In UK, it is 20,000 pounds, whereas the per capita GDP in UK was is about 22,000 uh, pounds. In Sri Lanka, the WHO definition, this was the best what we could get. Cost effectiveness of an intervention is if it is less than the per capita GDP of that country per colleague. That means after the intervention, if the patient lives for one quality year, then it is it is taken as cost effective and very cost effective. If it falls between one to three times the per capita GDP per quality, it is taken as effective. So based on this, cardiac interventions are considered to be highly cost effective even in Sri Lanka. So when you intervene, always remember this, you don't treat a lesion. You see a heart with a defect, but remember that defective heart belongs to a child. You have to consider other aspects of that child when you plan your intervention. Say, a complex heart disease in a normal child with a com compared to a complex heart disease in a bedridden child due to cerebral palsy, are we going to interview? That child belongs to a family. So family issues also has to be taken into consideration when you plan out your management plan for that child. Then that child lives in a society. You have to consider what the society will get back from the repair of that congenital heart disease before you intervene. Because ultimately, in Sri Lankan setting, that society will pay for the correction of that heart defect. Society and the family, to some extent, will for, pay for that. So there should be some reciprocity for the society as well. So it is not only seeing a lesion and correcting it, there is much more to it. So when should a country start a government-sponsored pediatric cardiac program? Ideal is when the IMR of that country drops to below 20. Cuba started it when their IMR dropped to below 20. India started it when their IMR was around 80. But remember, it's not a government-sponsored program. It's a private program. Even now, the dominant program in India is private sector. In Sri Lanka, we lagged behind. Our IMR dropped to below 20 around 1996, but we started our program in 2006-2007 when our IMR was, has dropped to around 11. So where do we stand at the moment when it comes to care of children with heart disease? We have 10 board certified pediatric cardiologists plus two senior registrars after their training. So we have altogether 12 pediatric cardiologists covering the whole country. We have one cardiothoracic center, that is the Lady Ridge Hospital. And our suspicion and diagnosis is perfect. I would say near perfect. We don't miss complex lesions. We rarely get a TGA coming later than first two weeks of life. So we have an excellent primary healthcare system and a hospital network, which will detect cyanosis early and refer these patients to us for timely intervention. But still, we miss simple lesions. That is the worst thing that can happen. Because if you miss an ASD, that will be detected around 20, 30 years by the VOG when that mother goes for pregnancy. I think VOGs do a very good job in detecting cardiac lesions because most of the ASDs are detected by VOGs in later life. So do not miss an ASD. Whenever you go for school medical inspection or your private practice or wherever, always look carefully, auscultate carefully for fixed splitting of second heart sound. If you hear it, always refer. You might hear a two by six ejection system click mama in the pulmonary area. If you take an ECG, you will see a RSR pattern. Look for ASDs because other lesions you will not miss. ESDs, you will have a very good murmur, you will not miss. And PDS, you will not miss. But ASDs are commonly missed. And the pathetic thing is that 20 years, 25 years, we have to tell the patient that you have become inoperable. And the child life is gone. They are getting ready to marry. They are getting ready to have children. But 
everything is contraindicated after that. So don't miss an AST. Interventions wise, treatment wise, catheter interventions, we don't have much of a waiting list. Even if an emergency comes today, we can do it tonight. Surgery, we have a long waiting list. We have to do about 2000 surgeries per year, but currently we can do about only 900 surgeries a year. So what is the solution? We have to find our own solutions to develop infrastructure and manpower to reach 2000 surgeries per year. So this is our plan. We have we are building the Little Hutz building, 12-story building. This is where it stands today. We have completed the structure. One day it will be like this, hopefully by the end of this year or early next year. Fund collection, we have collected through Little Hearts Fund alone 900 million, close to 1 billion, and government has spent about 500 million up to now. So funds wise, we are relatively okay, but we need more funds. So ladies and gentlemen, if we do not do anything, 50% of these children will not live. That is why we have to do something to address this congenital heart disease issue. So it is your chance to contribute. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that very informative presentation. I now invite Dr. Saraji Vijayasekara, Secretary SLM Expert Committee in Rehabilitation. She's also the past president of Sri Lanka Association of Child Development to speak on management of a child with Down syndrome. Over to you, madam. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk uh, on this topic. Can you see my slides now? Yes, ma'am, can see. Okay, so uh, sorry for that technical delay. Uh, so, um, so my topic actually uh, leads to management of a child with Down syndrome. And I know that uh, Manjula mentioned about primary prevention, secondary prevention and tertiary prevention. Uh, with regard to the primary prevention, I think we have ways and means of detecting Down syndrome early, early in the pregnancy. And also um, the Down syndrome, we know that the commonly associated with the uh, maternal, with advanced maternal age. But unfortunately in our country, the, although we detect it at the first trimester or the second trimester by certain investigations, we are unable to go in for a, a Miss uh, abortion uh, due to Down syndrome itself, unless the mother is at risk. So therefore we have to uh, go in the path of secondary and the tertiary prevention. So Down syndrome uh, occurs in about one in every 600 births, which is kind of a, a fairly a high number. And it is the commonest genetic abnormality in the world. Uh, so genetics, I think Professor Vajira also elaborated on this. So we have this normal uh, karyotype and then we have this trisomy 21 and there are other ways. This is the non-disjunction Down syndrome, which is common in the advanced maternal age, but there are other ways and means which are rarer forms of uh, transmitting the Down syndrome to children. So I'm not going to talk about it uh, in this lecture. So when you when a Down syndrome child is born, whether it was detected or suspected at the antenatal period, or even if not, once the baby is born, there are features that we could detect a Down syndrome. Uh, these are mostly done by the neonatologist. So uh, starting from the head, there could be a brachycephaly, and then low set ears, up slanting eyes, small mouth, uh, then the hands are short and stubby, and then there will be a sandal gap if you look closely, uh, and also there could be a heart murmur. So with these clinical features, we suspect Down syndrome, and of course supported by the genetics karyotyping, we could easily uh, confirm that it's a Down syndrome, and uh, uh, before the discharge, usually we counsel these parents, uh, and we say that there is this baby who's born to you, but then there are ways and means that we can manage this baby, uh, although it's a Down syndrome baby. I know that uh, uh, maybe a decade back, the, uh, the facts that was known in the community about Down syndrome is quite uh, not really good. They say that they are not able to do anything. So they just, just basically kept them at home and it's a social stigma in a way. But uh, currently I'm proud to say that a lot of parents are happy to raise Down syndrome children. And they know uh, probably with this uh, awareness programs that they know that the Down syndrome babies also could 
going to uh, some level, not as, although it's not as uh, good as in a normal child, but they are happy to raise these children. So common association, I'm giving you common associations here. So the commonest association would be the congenital heart disease. So I think uh, Dr. Dominda also mentioned about congenital heart disease. So majority of them, I'm sure they are doing uh, catheter interventions and surgeries of these patients. So it's about 60 to 80%, which is a high percentage. So obviously when a Down syndrome is, baby is born, you need to do an echocardiogram, which is a must. And then associated hypothyroidism, which if we detect early again as a at birth or even slightly later in the first, second week or so, there's treatment. So this is a treatable condition, uh, otherwise it adds to uh, other problems in later life. And then some of them will present with GI atresias with vomiting. So they are common associations, but uh, they are not missed because they can come with vomiting, bile stain vomiting and things like that. And then the eye uh, will have cataracts or myopia or astigmatism then uh, you will have hearing impairment, mainly conductive and sensory neural hearing loss. And the most uh, striking other feature is they are hypotonic. So therefore uh, they uh, have delayed milestones. And then later in life, sometimes they may come with atlantoaxial subluxation with the weakness of the lower limbs and bladder bubble involvement. That this is something that we need to look for if they come at a uh, later age with these symptoms. And also they can get early onset dementia, maybe by about 30, 35 years, they can have this memory loss. So uh, straight away, uh, so once you did know these uh, symptoms and the problems are there, so we need to uh, manage these children. So likewise, I think this is kind of a secondary management where we detect them early and uh, then when to start this management as early as possible afterwards. So once we tell this story to the mother or the, or the message to the mother, once they are confirmed, some of them like with the facial features alone, we can detect, but then some of them are very subtle in some uh, instances. So obviously the genetic, uh, genetic background is necessary for us to, one thing is to diagnose and the second thing is for counseling. So as early as possible after birth, we could diagnose them and then intervene in starts as early as possible after birth. And who should do this? It's a multidisciplinary team. It's not only the pediatrician, it's not only the neurologist or not only the physiotherapist, it's a uh, mixed bag of professionals who will uh, intervene to this child. So obviously uh, for medical problems, the cardiologists, eye surgeons, ENT surgeons are involved. And then when it comes to the hypotonia, the management of physical disability, we need a physiotherapist for early intervention, uh, occupational therapist, a speech therapist. And then later in life, uh, we will need a teacher who will uh, sort of need some support for them. So you need to intervene with the education background. And then orthopedic surgeons are necessary uh, since they're hypotonic, they are uh, their joints are very lax and uh, some of the muscle uh, releases also need to be done depending on the case and the social worker if they need some social support and of course the GP or the MOH and the family uh, public health midwife at the grassroots level need some uh, needs to do some work with them as they need a lot of social support and the psychological support and of course the psychologist to help with this family. So um, if I just say that now the hypotonia is a major feature in almost all the Down syndrome babies. So obviously their motor milestones are delayed. So parents are really worried about it. When, when is my child going to raise head, keep the head straight or sit without support or walk? That is the main concerns that, that they have when, when you encounter with the Down syndrome. So uh, the physiotherapist will, in, uh, will be... Uh, uh, will be uh, involved in this care with uh, strengthening the, and then facilitating the movements of this baby in a proper way and preventing the contractures that they may have if they are not intervened and position of, uh, positioning of the babies. And especially the uh, special consideration they have to give to the central core that involves the neck, back and the pelvis as uh, hypotonia. Uh, is a major problem with this uh, central uh, muscle tone. So basically the goal of physical therapy is to minimize the 
development of compensatory movement. And if you imagine a baby who has who is very hypotonic and where, joint, there, where the joints are very lax and the muscle tone is very low, you can imagine that they can move in awkward ways. So that is what is prevented by this early therapy. So if you can see these babies who are Down's babies who are being uh, managed at uh, centers where they are kept in certain positions, uh, and uh, they are being uh, dealt with to improve the central hypoctonia and all that. So uh, when it comes to occupational therapy, uh, again, from the very early stages, you have to position the baby, handling and carrying the baby. Uh, you have to educate the parents uh, to carry the baby in a way that they don't develop any uh, abnormal uh, postures. So, and also once they are slightly older, the activities of daily living has to be uh, incorporated into their lives because they have to be independent, especially the hand functions, the play activities and behavior. Now, when you talk about behavior, some of these Down syndrome babies can be behaviorally very challenging. They can have autism spectrum disorders. They can be very, um, you know, uh, very some some people will have uh, depressive problems and some are very aggressive. Uh, some will hit other children, and so there are lots and lots of behavioral issues with these children. And feeding, of course, um, they can uh, they are they are okay to swallow, but with the low, lack of muscle tone, the low muscle tone hypotonia, sometimes they will have aspirations and also regurgitation, and those problems also are possible in these babies. And the other main problem is the sensory issues with them. So sensory issues are where they identify certain uh, stimuli like uh, maybe tactile, gustatory, or uh, even uh, you know hugging the baby. They may not like certain textures. So those are sensory issues. So they may be running around, they may be having different, uh, you know, uh, repetitive kind of uh, trying to stimulate their vestibular system. So these sensory symptoms are commonly seen in Down syndrome babies. So the occupational therapist duty is to involve with these uh, aspects. And then, of course, the vision that is very important. I'll come to that later. Why vision is very important. We know that they can have cataracts. We know that they can have myopia. We know that they can have astigmatism. So much so, most of the Down babies or children we see uh, wear spectacles to improve their vision with regard to uh, myopia and things like that. Uh, so the other main uh, key, key stakeholder is the speech therapist. Uh, speech therapists will look into the feeding, the swallowing, because sometimes at the very early stages due to the hypotonia, their feeding and swallowing may not be as great as a normal baby. So they may have, uh, as I told you, maybe reflux, regurgitation, vomiting, mm -hmm. and also aspirations. And then uh, a little later, they are uh, receptive and understanding speech or rather receptive speech could be somewhat delayed. And expressive speech, most in most Down syndromes, the common problem that we encounter is the speech problems. Again, the speech therapist will look into the behavior and also the attentive part of it. So, so much so, occupational therapist and the speech therapist together will work towards the uh, intelligence and the IQ of these children and the understanding. So a main, most of these children have some intellectual disability. But however, it's difficult to predict the level. In Sri Lanka, we have different types of education systems that are used for Down syndrome children. Some work in normal school and normal class, and some may go into a special class. I mean, this is dependent on the education system and some go to the special schools as well. But having said that, the, P, the Down syndrome babies who are intervened from the beginning uh, and the mothers who are really keen on getting their children uh, uh, intervened uh, by, the, uh, by the advice of the therapists and, this, and the other key st stakeholders of the multidisciplinary team do really well. I would say that I'm really proud to say that most of the children who follow these clinics will attend a normal school in a normal class and they work uh, with other peers. So, uh, so this comes to the uh, concept of inclusive society. So society as uh, by, by and large is not only the child, not only the family, but the whole society. So therefore the inclusive society means 
that uh, that society aims at empowering and promoting the social, economic, and political inclusion of all, irrespective of their age, sex, disability, or any other uh, differences. So this, this society does not leave you know, anyone behind. So the society for this Down's child includes education from preschool to the mainstream. So what do you mean by inclusive education? This is the model that has been proposed internationally and nationally. And even actually we have been working with the Ministry of Education. And of course, they are, uh, they are really um, helpful in that aspect to include these disabled children into this inclusive education. So therefore, whatever the difference they have, regardless of their abilities, maybe motor, maybe intellectual, or whatever the difficulty, they have to get into this classroom, the same classroom as the other children. And also they have a safeguarded environment to make sure that they don't get injured, supposing the child cannot walk. There is some way that they, to support these children. And of course, we have seen that in normal classrooms, the inclusive classrooms, the other normal children help these students to go into the uh, playground or wherever uh, the activities they have. And in fact, they have shown that it is an important thing for the normally developing children as well, because they ultimately go into the society with these people who are disabled. So basically inclusive education is a very important concept which is being uh, introduced in the developed society as well as in Sri Lanka at the moment. So whatever the activities like concerts or Play, uh, play activities or sports meets, they have to take part as per their uh, ability. So uh, after seeing all that, what are the strengths of these down, uh, the Down syndrome in this inclusive society? They have a very strong visual awareness. That means whatever they see, uh, they, they keep it, um, that goes into their mind very, and is re recorded in their mind very well. And they have visual learning skills. If they see someone doing this, they learn it, right? And also they are able to use the sign language, the gesture and the visual support. So, so much so, I said that most of this in the, the most uh, mostly encountered problem with Down syndrome is the speech. So they are not able, able to visual or verbalize as other kids. So they are not able to express themselves. So, so the speech therapist and the initial uh, period, they use sign uh, the gestures or signs or whatever to indicate their needs. So that way they reduce the stress level of these children. And also their ability to learn using the written words, say, say if they want something, I want rice. If they write that, they will say, okay, yes, I want this rather than understanding sometimes it. I, I said that the intellectual level can be varying. So with all that, so you need to consider these things. So visual ability are very, very strong in this. And also other peers who are normal peers, they try to imitate them. So if you have a, like a role model in the classroom, they are usually imitating these people and then they take their cues from them. So therefore they are able to perform as well as their normal peers. So uh, what does the research say? So what they say is appropriate education provided in these inclusive classrooms are the best for these children with Down syndrome with regard to the spoken language where they improve a lot with this uh, spoken language, which I said is the main drawback here. And of course the reading and writing, the mathematics, the general knowledge and the social independence. So that is, uh, have been found in research that it is the best. And also after the learning um, in the school age, then it is a positive impact for the employment as well. They have to live uh, independently. They have to find their own jobs and they have to find a way of living because parents and the siblings will not, sometimes parents will not be there for them all the time. And then the siblings may not take care of them. And, and also the good thing is that there's no research. Uh, showing any benefit in, of education in special classes or special groups for children with Down syndrome. Now, having said that, uh, I said that in Sri Lankan context and even in the foreign countries, they do have special classes. They do have special schools for Down syndrome. But with, with this wide research, what they have found is there's no 
benefit, any additional benefit in educating them in the, the special classes. So obviously, uh, so it is an important thing that you should press the authorities to get themselves into the inclusive education and the normal class, normal stream. Okay, so when do, where do they need more support? So basically uh, there are gross motor skills in the fine and the gross motor skills are mainly uh, clumsy. They are clumsy and they may have difficulty. So that's where the inclusive education helps a lot, where the normal peers would help them to uh, overcome these tasks. And then um, if you have seen Down syndrome children, uh, they wear hearing aids sometimes because of their short middle ear canal and they have sensory neural hearing loss. And also they are uh, wearing spectacles for the loss of vision or impaired vision. And as I said, the speech and language delay, the problems with the articulation, sometimes they are what they say, the words that they say are not really uh, you can't make out of it because the articulation errors are there and comprehension and expression may be a problem. And other thing is the poor short-term auditory memory where they hear, they can't retain, but of course their visual memory is quite good, right? And um, thinking and reasoning power is not so good. And difficulty in concentration is a problem with these children. And so much so when they reach the adolescence, especially um, as we know that uh, Down syndrome males uh, they, they do develop into adolescence and they do have their sexual desires and things like that. Down girls can bear children. So it comes to the point where, because they don't understand and their thinking and reasoning patterns are not so good and their IQ levels are not uh, so low. We need to care for them. We need to keep an eye on them with the abusive, uh, child abuse can take place with these kids. And also uh, the other boys sometimes the boys who are in the adolescence, so they, they have their sexual desires. So therefore they tend to um, sort of uh, behave in a different way so that we have to keep an eye on that. So the teachers and the caretakers will have to be educated on this line when they reach their adolescence. Um, and most of these children need accommodations in school and at exams. So sometimes they may need some uh, supportive teacher or like uh, extra time for their testing or you know verbal uh, testing and things like that uh, for exams. Some of them have done very well. I will show you some pictures of some of them who have done very well. And then going into from further from the school, they have to work and then the work uh, work. Uh, what about the inclusion at the workplace? And there, there are some companies who hire Down syndrome people or persons with Down syndrome, and uh, they do uh, very well. So some known factories, like uh, uh, namely the biscuit factories, they run their own uh, baking system. And some of the officers, they hire their peers. So likewise, now, now the, these uh, workplaces, they empower them. They communicate with them. Right? And they also give them like uh, account, they are accountable for their activities and they build up their self identification and self con confidence. So basically um, that is something that we need to have in our society. Uh, we do have some of them, but not all of them. Uh, I mean, most of the government, uh, I think it's non-governmental mainly, the governmental organizations also, I think we should encourage this. So although the limitations are there in the no typical society, uh, but not in the individuals with Down syndrome. So you can see that there are some inspirations with some of these people who have been very great academics, who have been athletes, entrepreneurs, supermodels and play artists, musicians and designers. So this is from the world. So there's a lot of uh, good things that you have to tell the parent as they are gifted with a Down syndrome baby. So that is something that will uh, keep up them, the momentum of uh, caring for these children. And I, I would like to end with this uh, few pictures. Uh, this is Kosala, who's actually an international Canadian dancer. And also uh, the circle is Nili, who is a academic actually. Uh, and she was, this is for, from the last year picture, last year top 10 women, uh, top 10 women who were selected for the International uh, Women's Day. So there's no uh, 
there's no uh, limitations. You could easily improve these Down syndrome babies. There's primary prevention by asking the mothers to not to become pregnant when they're old, that is not done. So, and no abortions uh, with Down syndrome babies, but you can see the good outcome of these Down syndrome children. So if everyone, if each one of us uh, pass this message on to the, or keep this message with us and pass it on to the people where they have Down syndrome babies and who are really uh, devastated, sometimes psychologically, the parents are really down and the whole family setup is down. So if you can empower them, uh, that is the best gift that you can give to them. And also our society will also improve with, uh, and as uh, we were all talking about the quality of life. So quality of life of these children will be improved as well as the family and the society. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, Thank you, Madam, for that very beneficial presentation and the talk. So this brings us to the end of today's session. As the convener of the SLMA Expert Committee on Birth Defects, it gives me great pleasure to thank and congratulate the eminent speakers for their excellent thought-provoking talks. Uh, this uh, topics today range from birth, defe birth defects to global best practices on birth defects care and prevention to diagnosing the undiagnosed cases, genetic testing, and counseling. It included COVID-19 and possible birth defect, which was a very timely uh, topic as well, and also caring for a child with congenital heart diseases to managing a child with Down syndrome. So one of the highlights of today was the launch of the poster of the National Birth Defects Registry. And I would also like to thank all of those who participated today amidst your busy schedule and very challenging times. Um, in making today's webinar a success. Wish you all a very good afternoon and thank you very much.